morning, everybody, and welcome to our monthly webinar series from The Change Leader, where we have experts from key areas that higher ed institutions need to grow their institutions. My name is Dr. Drum McNaughton. I'm the CEO of The Change Leader. We're a management consultancy that creates sustainable higher ed institutions through implementing common sense solution to institutions' problems without sacrificing their history, goals, and values. Our webinar today help, focuses on helping institutions overcome resistance to change through holistic approaches to planning, alignment, and attunement, all of which lead to improved enrollment and financial performance. The American Quality Foundation, in conjunction with Ernst & Young a couple of years back, published a study in which they looked at 945 management practices over 580 organizations in Japan, Canada, and the US. And the best practices metrics they used were market performance, operations, productivity, and financial management. What they found were there were only three universally beneficial practices that had any kind of impact on the metrics regarding, of the, regarding the starting position of the company, uh, whether they were early stage, late stage, middle stage in their growth. These three things were strategic planning with good implementation practices, business process improvement if they were focused on the customer, and lastly, the continuous broadening of breadth and depth of leadership and management practices. Today, we're going to talk about all three of those with, in conjunction with resistance to change. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if you download the slides from the uh, presentation, you'll see that the notes that I have and what I'll talk to on the slides will be on there in a little bubble and usually in the upper left hand corner of the slide. Feel free to download those. And as we're going along, if you have questions, uh, I'll be sure and download those. And if it's appropriate, I'll interrupt the talk. If not, I'll, I'll hold them till the end. And for those of you who are on and stay to the end, we have a few free gifts that we'll uh, mention at the end, including uh, some free consulting if you'd like it. So let's go ahead and get started. First off, higher ed is in a very different state than it was 10 or 15 years ago. What we're seeing is enrollments are down, trending down. Most institutions, especially the private nonprofits, revenues are not meeting current expenses. They are borrowing from their endowment or they don't have an endowment at all. They don't have an institutional strategic plan, or if they do, it's not really followed or updated on a regular basis. And in conjunction with that, there's no real academic strategic plan, or if there is, it's not really aligned with the institutional strategic plan. Faculty, the, the actions of the faculty really don't relate to the current environment that an institution is in and that the whole industry is in. And lastly, the faculty think they should have a greater say in everything or and or they're obstructing needed change that the administration sees. This is real, really problematic, and we see this in the different kinds of surveys that we have done recently. This is a copy of last year's sur survey from uh, the business issues from the cabinet, and you can see the top issues here are affordability of education, uh, Likert scale, one to five, it's 3.88, increasing the reliance on tuition, you know, that's high, decreasing, stagnant revenues. Well, this year's survey had the same thing. Uh, only student retention was up at 3.92. Increased reliance on tuition, 3.83. So that is up from 3.62. Decreasing enrollment, you know, that's at 3.58 and diversification of revenues at 3.5. Again, that one was up. This is very much in conjunction with what the uh, Inside Higher Ed Survey of Chief Business Officers were at the end of last year. They believe that financial or higher ed is in a financial crisis. 71% of them believe that the media reports are accurate about the financial crisis. And this number has risen over the past two years. Many of them are reducing their costs. They're making a more concerted effort on retaining students. Increasing enrollment is important, of course, but 
it costs far more to retain a, or I'm sorry, costs far more to recruit a new student than it does to retain. So, and many of them are starting to get decent results from these retention efforts. We have a new normal. The number of traditional students, college age is decreasing, and that's just a, a function of birth rate. Now 40% of the 17 and a half million undergrads attend community or, or technical colleges, a two-year college. Students and their parents are believing there's less value in higher ed. That's propagated in many cases by the media, but they're believing that and that's the reality. Here's the big one, is that 95, and I think this is actually closer to 98% of all institutions, they look alike, they teach the same subjects, they have the same degree programs, and they don't differentiate themselves. This is a real challenge when a student is going to make a choice as to whether they go to a university or not. The other is distance from the university has become a far greater factor in selection of a university. Many students just don't have the money to be able to go away, stay in a dorm, et cetera. They're more commuting to their colleges. So, unfortunately, I think education's become a commodity and we need to change that. We need to take a look at the things that cause students to think it's a commodity and make some changes with those. Today, we're gonna show you a new way to think about higher ed and hopefully you'll be able to put some of these actions into action in the near future. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at a holistic management system. Here at TCL, we talk about holistic management. It's very critical that you do that. A holistic management system has to have, look at the outside environment, which is what causes the changes. What's, where is it that you wanna go? You know, the metrics, how do you measure it? How do you get there? So the five strategic questions really are, A, where do you want to be in the future? You know, what are your ends, your outcomes, your purposes, your goals? Your, what's the holistic vision? You know, how do you know when you're going to get there? This is your metric, your feedback mechanisms. Where are we now? This is your current state assessment. And then how do you get there? Your strategies, your actions. And then lastly, how does the environment change as we go along? So we've got to start off with a poll here. Does your institution have a strategic plan? So let's get this poll launched. And if you could take just a moment to weigh in on the, uh, the answers here. We're seeing a lot of responses come in here and uh, we'll give it another, say, yeah, 30 seconds or so. Okay, short 30 seconds. So we'll close the poll and share the results. And this is pretty good. 80% of the folks on the phone say that they have a strategic plan for their institution and the other 20% doesn't know. And that's, that's not unusual. Actually, that's a little high. Most, most organizations are right around the three quarters mark, you know, 60, 75%. So that's pretty good. So let's move to our next poll. Did your institution's employees and faculty participate in the strategic plan's development in a meaningful way? And when I say meaningful, what I mean is having direct input into things before the plan was published. So we're getting some, some votes in here. And uh, wow, this is really high. We've got pretty much everyone saying that Yes, oh, we've got one no. So we've got about 80% uh, who are saying that they did in fact participate in a meaningful way and 20% no. I commend you folks, your, your institutions are doing many, many things that are really, really good. This is great news. So this is one of the keys to overcoming resistance to change. So let's continue on and thank you for your participation in that so far. So let's go into implementing change. This is what most change efforts look like. This is a photo from Mavericks off the 
coast of uh, down a little south of San Francisco. Uh, Eighty percent of all change efforts fail to realize the results that were expected going in. This is this is not good because what this is a loss of time, a loss of money, a loss of buy-in from the people in the organization for getting things done. This is really, really not good. So change fails for a number of reasons. You know, there's too much complacency, you know, failing to create a sufficiently powerful guiding coalition, you know, the group of people who are going to push the change through. Uh, under communicating the vision, this is a critical one. When we do change, and I, I coach executives through change, we tell them for the first two weeks that the change is announced that you ought to be out on with a clear stump speech. Is this is why we're doing it? You know, we're sorry it's going to affect so many people. We're going to do our best to take care of them, but it's really important we do it because this is what the market is telling us, etc. So you can take a look at all these things here. There are a number of reasons that block why change gets put into effect, and we'll talk about those and compare those to uh, John Cotter's Eight Steps to Realizing Change in a few slides. So part of the reason why change fails is a lot of myths that surround it. Many people think that change follows an orderly, rational process, and we all know that that does not work. It's, it's never smooth sailing once you get through, even if you get through. Most people don't realize that to do serious change in an organization, and this includes culture change, because anytime you do a major change, there is going to be culture change involved. It takes two to five years for an organization to get back to the same level of productivity that it had prior to the change. Now, part of the reason for this is you don't know who's doing what jobs. Uh, you may have a formal org chart, Work doesn't get done by a formal org chart. We all know this. It gets done by the informal org chart. Mary may go to Sally or Joe or whoever saying, I need to get this financial aid application through. And, you know, Sally may not be in the job anymore. So who does she go to at this point to get that thing done? Is there training that needs to be? So, so it's, a, it's a very nebulous thing and change isn't easy to do. The other thing is, if you think about how a change happens in the past, it's usually decide, deliver, and defend. It's the three Ds of old change. You know, People will follow because I say it needs to happen. Well, that's just not good enough anymore, especially with the new generations coming into universities. Many people are, you know, into the WIFM, the what's in it for me about the change. So we need to think about those type of things as we go forward. Really, organizations don't fail for lack of talent or for a vision. They really fail because of execution. It's that blocking and tackling that great companies consistently do well and strive to do better. You know, change, successful implementation of change requires change management and an implementation plan. It requires an alignment of the overall strategies, the structures, and the processes. And it requires, most of all, the attunement with the people, a shared vision across the organization. These are critical things, and we'll talk more about these in just a moment. So we have another plan, uh, poll coming up here, which let me pull up. And does your institution have a implementation plan for its strategic plan? So we got the, the poll going out here. And we're starting to see a few answers come in here. Uh, please take a moment and do this, take care of the poll. And we're seeing some, some good answers coming in. Uh, this is actually pretty good. We're seeing some uh, fairly high responses to the, to the uh, question. Uh, let's close the poll and share those results with you. 75% say yes. Now, this is a really good thing. This is high. Normally, it's about 30 to 40% say yes. Now, the type of implementation plan that we're talking about isn't what you have with an IT implementation. It's how are you going to implement your strategic plan. So I don't know 
if you'd known that, if it would have made a difference in the answers or not. But, you know, 75% is still really good. So excellent on you folks. This is what it's like to try and implement change without an implementation plan. You can see right in front of you, but you can't really see what's up the line. And it's those gotchas that come up the line that make a big difference. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna talk just a little bit about the holistic management system that we use and our clients use. And we'll show where that implementation plan comes in. We start off with, you know, how is the organization positioned? What are the products? What are the courses? How do you position them? What does your website say? What do you tell the customer about the customer value or the brand promise there? We move down to the future environmental scan where we look out into the future five to 10 years to anticipate what's going to be happening. One of the big problems with strategic plans and why people don't follow them is their environmental scan is usually done right here in the current day and they mistake that for a SWOT, the current state analysis, instead of looking at the plans and what they anticipate their environment to be in the future and create strategies to make sure that it takes advantage of that. Then we get to the vision, the mission, the values, positioning statement, really your ideal future vision. We get to metrics, the feedbacks, the key success measures. Then we get into the current state assessment to figure out where we are right now. Then we work on the alignment of the delivery, the attunement of the people with the strategies development. We get to our three-year business plan, our annual plan. Then we get to the plan to implement. So see, so we develop our strategic plan and then we build in our plan to implement it and we have those processes for the change and the annual review. The last piece which we do, which you folks have already told me you do this a bit, is you talk with your key stakeholders, what we call our stakeholder attunement process. This happens every step along the way to get their input. They don't have the final decision on it, but their input is very valuable. So this is the management system that we use. Dwight Eisenhower had a very interesting saying. He said, plans are nothing. Planning is everything. It's really the process of the planning which brings out these deep ideas, these, these nuggets that people go, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Why aren't we doing that in our organization now? So the research, the discussion, the planning process, it's really critical to do these type of things. We talked a little bit about Cotter's eight-step change process and why change goes wrong. So let's match these up. The first in that is the sense of urgency. And then if you allow too much complacency, nobody's going to get behind the change. They're going to say, ah, oh, this is just another initiative that we see. You know, we'll wait till the CEO changes and then we won't have to worry about that. We'll worry about, you know, that with the next guy so or next woman. So, you know, too much complacency. Transparency lends into this very clearly because if you cry wolf too many times, people are not going to believe you. One of the things that higher ed institutions are notorious about is not revealing their financials to employees, to faculty. If people had an understanding of what's going on and what the bottom line looks like, they may be much more open to allowing the change. That's part of establishing a sense of urgency. Creating that guiding coalition. It's that core team of people, and that doesn't necessarily mean your, mean your key executives, your key stakeholders, you know, they're the ones who have the biggest influence in many respects, other than possibly the CEO or the president. So building that guiding coalition through that stakeholder attunement process to get the change. And then if you don't have that, you know, it, it creates the opportunity for change to fail. Obviously developing a vision of a strategy, but then people really underestimate the power of that vision and that stakeholder alignment process. I mean, the organizations that we've helped with change, they say that they're, the 
resistance to change is reduced by 90%. I mean, that's a huge number, folks. And it's all about the power of that vision and getting the stakeholders aligned behind a shared vision. Communicating the vision can't be overemphasized, you know, under communicating, obviously. Empowering employees for broad-based action. The executive team, the cabinet can sit on high and say, we want to do this. But unless they empower the employees to get things done and share the vision with them so that they can do what's necessary, your change is going to fail. And it's the executive's job to make sure that the obstacles are not allowed to get in place to block the vision. We'll talk a little bit about this when we get to some of the structures that organizations should put in place to make sure the change actually happens. Generating the short-term wins, the, the antithesis of that is failing to create those or failing to celebrate the short-term wins. Don't we all feel better when, you know, if you're a golfer, you've hit a really long drive or you've hit, made a putt that you didn't think you were gonna make, or if at work you're able to turn around, if you're teaching, you're able to turn around a student to where you can see that light bulb gone, go on. I mean, that's important. That's really critical for celebrating a short-term win. You can see it in yourself. You can just imagine what it's like when you can publicize those to the rest of your, your institution. You know, consolidating the gains, producing more change. Change is a cyclical thing. It, it, one thing builds on the next. If you don't do that, if you declare victory too soon, you know, look what happened in Iraq when George Bush landed on the aircraft carry and declared victory. Well, the Iraq war is still a mess in some respects. So, you know, you don't declare victory too soon. The last and possibly the most important of these is anchoring the new approaches in the culture. You heard me say earlier, culture change is the absolute most difficult thing to do. We'll talk about how to get there, but frankly, if you don't anchor these in, then it's going to be very, very difficult to sustain the change over the long term. Here's just an org change 101, and I'll put my professor hat on a little bit. You've got really three stages of change. You have the frozen where you're un unaware of the change. Then you come into the unfreezing where you're creating the motivation to change. That's the conscious stage. Uh, you move to the new level and then you refreeze. You know, this is very similar to uh, Shine's four stages of, of learning. I think it was Shine. I may have the name, the, the reference wrong. One of the big things though is you have this critical point where you have to put support in if you want the new behaviors to continue. That's really critical. We're going to see why in just a moment. We have what we call the roller coaster of change. And this is based on work from, from William Bridges, who if you folks know the book Transitions, or Steve Haynes, who I studied under for many years, Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Peter Senge, and, and Kurt Lewin. And so you have a normal change curve where you have current state. You have the ending, the neutral zone, the new beginning is from William Bridges, and those are the three stages that he talks about change. So in a change process, when the change is announced, people have feelings of shock, anger, depression, anxiety. This is assuming that they know nothing about the change, the organization is not transparent, and the layoffs, the cutbacks, the, lateness, the uh, retiring of programs, et cetera, comes as a complete shock to people. So what is the executive's role in this? And this goes back to something I said a little while ago. You need to acknowledge people's feelings by listening, empathizing, explaining the reasons for the change, and then start developing those key phrases as a rallying cry. Now, the neutral zone is kind of the hang-in point. You're at the bottom. Morale is down. You've got a choice. You can continue up the curve, or you can go down the curve. And that frequently happens if you're not doing many of the things that we've talked about already. Let's just assume we're going to go up the curve. You're presenting the new vision, the plans going forward. This is really important stuff. Uh, people are starting to accept it. 
you know, you're strengthening those inner group connections. You're setting up the transition structure. And you may have had this stuff already planned out. You should have, uh, but now you're announcing it. You're reviewing the policies, procedures, and you're setting up the reward systems, the what's in it for me. And then finally, you're getting to that hope piece where people are starting to participate in the new vision. You're celebrating the new wins. There's reinforcement, you know, all of those good things that maple people say, okay, this was all worth it. Ultimately, when folks get back here, if you've done it right, they'll remember what happened in the change, but it will be, okay, This we can see what happened. This is a good thing. One of the big things that most executives do not remember, actually, there's a couple of things. One is the survivors in an organization, assuming it's a layoff. The survivors see how the organization treats the people who have been laid off. That is a big thing as to whether the employees who are staying believe they can trust the organization. I know one organization who used to lay faculty off with two weeks notice. And of course, we all know that faculty, if you're trying to get onto a tenured position, something other than an adjunct, it's usually a year hiring cycle. So people know at that organization that they, you know, I could be next. They're never really fully engaged and all in with the organization. The other piece is everybody, executives, employees, faculty, they all go through this change. Now, when the, enjoy, the um, executives make the decision that they need to do this, they already, they work through everything in their planning to get up here. When they announce it, everybody is back here. So executives frequently say, I can't understand why people aren't on board with this change. They've forgotten that they've had to go through the same curve and they're up here. They need to acknowledge people's feelings and help them through the change. Like I said, the first two weeks a change is announced, the executives ought to be out in the university, talking to people, making sure that they understand why this is happening, listening to them, empathizing, making sure that the people feel heard. It's critical, critical stuff, folks. Some of the things that you can do to make change stick, and we're going to go over all of these in a, in a greater way. You know, we're going to talk about the change structures, the initiatives, metrics, supporting what you create, and the leadership, the psychology, which we've talked a little bit about already. So change structures. Got to have visionary leadership. We talked about this. These are the folks who are leading. You know, They're driving the bus. They're getting you where. And the personal leadership plans. What are you going to do with each step of the change? How are you going to interact with the people? What are the key messages that need to get out? These are all critical things. You an executive committee. Executive committee looks at the overall organization as to what needs to be done. Weekly meetings, attention. What are the top priority items that need to be done from the strategic plan? Make sure they're happening. Oops, my slides are out of order. My apologies. You need a change leadership steering team, which is either the, the core planning team becomes this, or it may be separate. These are the folks who are actually tracking the changes that are going on and making sure that everything is working together. And they make sure that there's follow through be via a yearly comprehensive map for implementation. A program office. These are the folks who make sure everybody's not stepping on each other. This is critical, especially with large enterprise-wide projects, IT implementations. You've got to make sure that one person isn't doing something that another person would be uh, messing up. And then you've got your project team, which is day-to-day -day coordination of the implementation process. This is the one that's really, this is critical, I'm not saying that they are all aren't, but this one's critical. This one and your change leadership steering committee, because what generally happens is you've got day to day and you've got the change processes. And we all know what wins out. It's the day to day. It's the project team 
and the change leadership steering committee that make sure that the things are moving forward as they need to. You're taking people things off people's plates when you're putting new things on there. They're allowing time for training, for the things that people need to do to get up to speed in their new jobs. I mean, all of these things are critical and the processes need to be make, sh make sure that they're adjusted as well. All of these things are critical to make sure that change is successful going forward. A friend of mine used to say, anybody can do planning. I'm gonna put my smartest people on the change effort. He's absolutely right. Because when you do this, you're gonna be, you'll be far better off in making sure the changes that are needed to. Of course, everyone knows that change is really smooth and it you know, just happens just like wave sets coming in at Mavericks. Well, we all know that that isn't true. So, because we have something that we call resistance to change. So let's start in with our next poll. Resistance to change occurs when I attempt to make changes in, in the institution. So, getting a few folks voted here. If uh, everybody else could, could vote, that would be great. Um, yeah, this is, wow, I'm, this is good. So, we'll go ahead and close the poll out and share the results of this. Three quarters of people have resistance to change and 25% and don't. Well, that's, that's actually pretty good numbers. Uh, and that's pretty much what I expected. Uh, I'm curious about how that person doesn't get resistance to change. I mean, when I try and change myself, I get resistance to change. So I'm, I'm impressed that one organization doesn't have resistance to change. So well, let's talk a little bit about resistance to change. So, there really are three different types of resistance to change. There's the mental models, the psychological, the, the people change. This is the hardest one to change, but you've also got your, your structures, you know, I mean, your org structures, your policies, different things along those lines, and you've got business processes. What you see at the top is just like the iceberg. You see 10, 13% of the output, but you don't see all the other stuff going on. And if you want to make the biggest change, you have to change people's mental models, the way they think about things. This, again, this is just, change management really is all about people. The bottom line really is people choose to change or not to change based on their mental models and the trust that they have in their leadership. Or in other words, they don't get it, they don't like it, or they don't like you. That sums up change as well as I, as I know how to do it. So what happens typically is if people like what you're doing or if they like you with the old way of doing change, the decide, the deliver, and defend, they'll follow it. If they don't like it or there's not enough with them, what's in it for me, then they're gonna resist the change. And it really doesn't matter whether or not the change is justified in economic or technological terms. If you take a look at the merger a few years back between Compaq and HP when, when Carly Fiorina was the CEO, the change from a business perspective made fabulous sense. Compaq from a culture perspective were, were go-getters when it came to sales. I mean, they and Dell were the number one and number two sales for computers at the time. HP, very scientific, very methodical, plotters. They made the best printers that were out there. So on paper, it looked like a match made in heaven. You know, great sales, great hardware, great printers, other things, bring them together. Nah, didn't work. It took them years to get over to where it would be even close to the same kind of productivity. And we've seen HP, which Compact gave up their name, it became all of HP. HP, we've seen more and more layoffs as they've gone through. It just didn't work because the cultures were way too different. So that gets into the conversation around stakeholders. 
in higher ed institutions have many, many stakeholders. You've got, you know, university in the middle, but you've got administration, faculty, alumni, the business and the community, the parents and the students. All of these are key stakeholders in an institution. It used to be this model where you'd have the, the trustees, you know, the administration would work with everybody else. This just doesn't work anymore. I mean, from a governance perspective, there's too much liability to the trustees to make it work, but also too, everybody in here wants a say on how things are going, the stakeholder attunement process, which is critical. So the other thing is we've got some generational differences going on right now. We've got five different generations in the workforce, and this is especially true in higher ed, where you know, we've got the older folks, the boomers like myself, Gen X, the millennials, and the 2020s that are coming out. These people all have different priorities. They also communicate very differently in the same way. You know, influences. Gen Y is peers. Gen 2020 creational forums, you know, lounge activities brand connections, conversions, social media. You know, for those of us who are boomers, and that's where most of us are who are leading organizations at this point, uh, we relate to the phone call. Gen Y, they wanna be texted, or Gen 2020, Gen Z, they want social network. The communication styles are totally different. Are we as boomers adapting to other styles of communications. Most organizations do, but a lot of them don't. They'd have different expectations though. You know, three out of five students expect to be able to work remotely. This is the newer generations, so Gen Y, Gen 2020. Millennials, they don't feel like they're making enough money. Well, who does feel like they're making more money? But the millennials feel like they're the Gen Y, they are going to be swapping jobs much more regularly in the next five years where you'll see more and more folks, unless they're forced, they'll stay in the same job. Millennials think they need more recognition and they think they deserve their dream job. So, you know, there's a lot of different things with the generations, all of which need to be taken care of or taken into consideration with when we're doing or change. Now, here is the the stakeholder attunement process. This is a process where, as you saw in the previous diagrams, people are talking back and forth. You've got your core planning team talking to the key stakeholder groups to get their input on what's going on. In a planning effort, you've got generally your executives who don't necessarily know what's going on in the front lines. They see the trends in business, they wanna go in a particular direction, but they're not necessarily up on everything that's going on so that they can make mistakes. You know, here's an example of that type of thing that we, when we did this, there was an Air Force wing that we did a strategic planning for. They had an adjustment or they, a change of mission from air refueling to the unnamed or unmanned reconnaissance vehicles like the Global Hawk. It, you know, I had a thousand people in it and it was a huge process. They got together a core planning team of about eight people and they had a stakeholder group of about 60 people who because they were Air Force, they had their own flying toys and could fly in for meetings. So the planning team would come up with, you know, the proposed vision, the proposed mission statement, all these things, we'd go out and we would talk to the key stakeholders and it would be the planning team talking to the key stakeholders to get their input. This happened the whole way through the process. And what was really neat is if anybody has dealt with the military before, you know most of them are very mission oriented, very serious, et cetera. Well, when this plan was rolled out at the base theater to 500 people, they got a standing ovation for the plan. They, they, I've never seen that happen with any kind of organization. But what made it even neater was you could see people turning to their neighbor and say, that was my idea. 
that's how you get buy-in because people support how they create or what they create. So going through this process, you know, this, this isn't easy. It's creativity at its finest. And it comes through intense dialogue through thought. It requires getting away. When we do these planning sessions, we normally go off site. I've actually gone to the point where I've taken people to take their battery out of their cell phone or turn their cell phone off because you've got to be all in in this conversation to be able to reflect what's going on. The stakeholder attunement process is, is critical in this because it improves the quality of the answers that you get for you know the current and the future challenges. When you've got somebody who's on the front line saying, you know, I'm starting to see students say this when I ask them about are they interested in this program? Is that information making it to the people who can make changes in the program, the faculty? I mean, this is all part of the continuous improvement is what accreditation is supposed to be about. You know, it helps you to truly understand what's going on at the university. Most importantly, it helps develop the buy-in and the commitment to the answer, which reduces the resistance to change. Sustaining the change is all about leadership. And, you know, we've got the process. We've talked about having the strategies. We've talked about the processes for making the change. Now, how do you sustain it? Now, Dilbert happens to be one of my favorite cartoon characters, and this is one of my favorite ones from Dilbert. It says, is your project plan done yet? I can't do a plan until you tell me the strategy. My strategy is to make you do a plan. Sometimes leadership just radiates from my body. Well, it's unfortunate because we see many, many leaders who are like this is they don't really have a strategy. They don't know how to communicate it to people. And then they think they're doing a really good job when they're not. So let's talk a little bit about leadership. What is leadership? Leadership, it's a relationship. It's about self-development. It's about constant learning. Leaders are the best learners, or best leaders are the good best learners. And it's an ongoing process. If we look back at our own careers, we can see that we should be, most of us should see, we're far better leaders now than we were five years ago or 10 years ago. It's an internal process and it's a choice. People choose to become leaders. Unfortunately, too many higher ed institutions promote people, especially in the faculty ranks, based on publication. And that's not a good way. Leadership is a people process. It really is the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle for shared aspiration. It's an art form. You're getting other people to want to move to a new place for a shared aspiration or a shared vision. This is, this is all about leadership. And then Drucker and Bennis probably said it best of all. <clears throat> Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. There's a story, if, if folks remember, if you've done any running, you remember Gore-Tex, the, uh, the material that, you know, kept, you know, wicked the, wick the uh, moisture away from your body and uh, still kept you dry from the inside. And it was lining most running, running jackets and, and pants and things like that. Their factory up in Massachusetts burned down. This was a number of years ago. And they could have just laid everybody off. But the president said, no, this is my work family. We're going to keep everybody on the payroll at their same salary, same benefits, everything, until we rebuild. 18 months later, they rebuilt. What kind of loyalty did that organization have? Or what kind of loyalty did the employees have to that organization and that leader. I mean, that is almost, almost never done nowadays. But what if it were done? Bottom line with change and with leadership has to do with the higher purpose. If change is not connected to a higher purpose, 
Why should we invest ourselves in it? People, and especially millennials, they commit to causes, not plans. Let's talk a little bit about the HR aspects. My buddy Albert, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Now this is not a statement about HR, but what this does talk to is it's critical, like Jim Collins says in his book, Good to Great, you've gotta have the right people on the bus, but even a step forward than that, you've gotta have the right people on the right bus in the right seats. Everybody has unique skill sets, and it's part of leadership to figure out what those skill sets are and how they need to be worked on, how they need to be positioned. This is critical stuff because you obviously don't want someone who isn't qualified to make major IT system changes on a particular system. You don't want them working on Oracle applications if that's what you're implementing or you don't want them building new academic programs in economics if their major is leadership. You know, those are very basic things, but everybody's got a certain skill set. Part of leadership is understanding what that skill set is and making sure people are working, one, where they want to, and two, where they're qualified. The other piece with this is any time that you have a change process, you've got to invest in training, which is marketing and training are usually the first things that get thrown out the window if there's any kind of budget crisis. So you've got to invest in your people and make sure that they're ready to do the job that you know that they can do and so they know they can do it as well. So let's put it all together. There are three requirements for creating these, sell, these financially sustainable, vibrant higher education institutions. You know, holistic thinking. You know, the leadership of the organization has to focus on the big picture, building the strategic plan, implementing it, and then measuring outcomes. The second, alignment. An institution's Strategies, structures, and processes must work together. If they don't work together, you're going to have things happen, and that's not good. And then lastly, the stakeholder attunement. People support what they help create. They want a say. Just think about it from our own perspective. We want a say in things that will affect us before the decision is made. So do your employees. They want input into things that are going to that they are going to affect them before that decision is made. We talked a bit about the holistic university management system <clears throat> with where you're going, how do you know when you're going to get there, where are you now, how are we going to get there, and what's the environment that we're going to be working in. <clears throat> We talked a bit about the overall process of strategic management systems, starting with you know, the customer value or the brand promise, the and future environmental scan, the ideal future vision, your metrics, where you are, you know, your strategies, including <clears throat> the annual plans and the budgets. And one point on budgets. Budgets are merely an affirmation of an institution's strategic plan. If you're not marrying your plan and your budgets, why even bother go through a planning project process? Planning is about making the tough decisions, and those happen, the strategy and then the plans right here. Because if money was unlimited, you could do everything you wanted to. It isn't, and you have to be realistic. We do this in year one, we do this in year two, year three and then you have to be able to execute it. And then you've got to have your plan for implementation. Here's an example of a 
university strategic management process. This was adapted from GE. GE does this type of process every single year in you know, the initial planning for the year, talking up the new possible initiatives, programs, you know, retreat, figuring out what's going on, early learnings, et cetera, doing surveys, finalizing the plans, the board approving it, um, what are the next year strategies, et cetera, and then going right through the whole process. One of the things that makes this successful is that it's done every year religiously, like clockwork. These meetings are scheduled a year out to do these. Second, hypo, high-performing employees. They're identifying people who are could move up into more senior positions, and they're doing this throughout the organization, and they're providing the training so that they can get them done. And then second, or lastly, they're out scanning the environment. Are we headed in the right direction? Are the students feeling it? You know, what are we doing? Are we getting the feedback from the people? Every institution should have something like this so that they have got a plan going forward. We all do academic ca calendars. Why shouldn't we do a strategic management calendar? Now let's talk about strategic management systems just a little bit. <clears throat> They basically fall into three categories. The reactive, you know, survival, you do budgets, you have financial objectives. You know, traditionally, you've got annual planning and three-year uh, financial forecast. Maybe you'll do a retreat, you've got vision, mission, values. And then you get into the proactive where you've got an academic strategic plan or you do actually a strategic planning process that goes out. Or you pull in all the things that we've talked about with this 21st century holistic management system. So let's have a poll. I'm kind of curious, and I will go back to this slide so that you can see it. I'm kind of curious as where folks are in their evolution. Are you reactive, traditional, proactive, or you don't really know? <clears throat> so, yeah, we're well, seeing pretty much what I usually see when we talk about this thing is pretty much three quarters of the people are reactive and the other is proactive. That's for those who are proactive, excellent. Really, really glad that you're doing that. Reactive, let's have a conversation, see what we can do to uh, help you get out of this area down here in the reactive. So here's what we do as a firm, and this is how we help organizations. You know, we take a look, and this is what you folks should be doing with your own organizations as you move forward down this path. You know, look at where your strengths are, your areas for growth. What's the external environment? What are the opportunities that are there? And we had a question I'm gonna interrupt here. Uh, what strategies can a higher ed leader use to get people, faculty, to want to create something? That's a really good question. Uh, what I, and I don't know the context for the question, but let me just take a stab at it, Monica. Uh, when you come up with an idea, our, our ideas, are they coming up organically or are they coming top down? Are you having meetings to talk about new ways we can improve? Is, is the organization being transparent to, with what's going on in the outside area? Do faculty have an opportunity to give input or is it all coming top down? Now, when you throw in the external organizations like Department of Education with different mandates, that makes it very difficult as well. But at the same time, can you explain why things have to be done the way that they are or 
can you give good reasons for it? You, you start to get into the decide, deliver, and defend when it's an outside mandate. But as part of your external scanning process, which we recommend organizations do every three months, because right now everything in higher ed is changing as fast as it is, as it is in the technology sector, you'll start to see these kind of things going on and you can make adapt. Sometimes you just have to say, cheery I, I, we're gonna do this. And other times you can have the discussion to say, this is something that's being mandated that we have to do. Other times it can be more of an organic change. Uh, if you want to discuss this more, happy to uh, have a conversation with you offline. And thank you for the question. So back to where we were assessing for strengths, areas of growth, external environment, positioning the institution. We didn't talk about positioning much, but positioning is critical when it comes to enrollment, when it comes to attracting the right students and hiring the right faculty. Uh, Carnegie Mellon 20 years ago was just this run of the mill university in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And they got a significant donation from one of their folks and they said, let's make this thing special. We want to specialize in IT. And they did that very thing. Now, Carnegie Mellon is known for IT, but specifically, they're in the top three, if not the top school in the world for artificial intelligence and robotics. And if you take a look at their website, it just, that's what you see is people on there working on things. That's about the brand promise. That's about positioning the institution and making sure it goes through all of your areas, your website, your marketing materials, your faculty are talking about it. These are all things that, that are going on. So that's, that's really about what it is. You know, strategic, we'll come in, we'll facilitate strategic academic long plans with the stakeholder attunement process and metrics. You help you with your three, one to three year operational plans, metrics. Develop the change management plan. If it needs to be, you know, org redesign necessary, change management structures, incentive rewards, program review, replacement and then implementing the change management and building the leadership capacity. So basically, everything that you need to do to change, this is what it is. These are the things that you have to do. And if you want a consultant to come in, you know, we know lots of folks, including me. So bottom line is we can't solve our problems with the same level of thinking we use to create them. So. We've had a couple of questions. Uh, if there are any other ones, great. We're right at the end of the hour, but we can stay a little longer. But for those of you who are here, I told you we'd have a free gift, so here it is. Uh, the first of these is we have an ebook on our website. So I'd suggest you go up and download that ebook. It's filled with great ideas on how to implement change in your organization. So feel free, go download that. For everybody who's on the call, uh, we'll give one hour free consulting. And this is not a sales pitch, folks. I'm all about trust. And when I say I'm not gonna try and sell you on something, that's it, I'm here to help you. We've had other folks take care, take advantage of this type of thing and they found it very, very helpful. So one hour free consulting to anybody on the call. Uh, we do do some other offers as well, the change management uh, readiness assessment. Normally we'll do that for about 25,000 today. If you do this up through, you know, one week after Easter, it'll be 15,000. And then if you wanna implement this strategic management system, including the planning, the stakeholder, and the implementation, we'll, normally we'll do that for 45,000. Today we'll do that for 35. So those are just some of the special offers and gifts we have for you for sticking around to the end. So if you're interested, email me here at thechangeleader.com or you can go up to the website and, and sign up for the consultation by on the link. And this should be on the, uh, the slide deck that you can download. So I wanna thank everybody for the participation. We are at the end and I don't see any other questions. So stay tuned, we will be doing more webinars. We usually do one or two every month. So thanks for attending and I hope you guys have a great day.